We live, we love, we serve. I want to draw your attention today. We just finished last week Unstoppable series. That was amazing. I enjoy every minute of it. Um, but this month is not a series per se. I, I'm, you know, the old folks, I'm just going to talk about Jesus this month. Because I'm convinced that everybody who claims to be a Christian really don't understand Jesus. That has become abundantly clear this past week for me. Whole folk in church, a whole lot of folk love or infatuated with the idea of being Christians, whatever that means to them, but they're not equally infatuated with following the teachings of Jesus. So this month, I'm going to talk about what it really looks like, what it means to say you follow the carpenter. We've had a series like this, and this is not a series this month, but I just want to shed some light in and bring some awareness to some folk who think they understand what it means to be a disciple. And so I want to look today at the Gospel of Mark, the second chapter. It's a rather lengthy passage. It's actually two stories that I want to read today. And I'm reading from the Message Bible, Mark chapter 2, 23, verse 23. I'm going to read through Mark 3, verse 6. It's not not too long, but I want you to stand with me this morning. And again, I'm reading from the Message Bible. Uh, here's how it reads. One Sabbath day, he was walking through a field of ripe grain. As his disciples made a path, they pulled off heads of grain. The Pharisees told on them to Jesus, look, your disciples are breaking Sabbath rules. Jesus said, really? Haven't you ever read what David did when he was hungry, along with those who were with him? How they entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar with the chief priest, Abiathar, right there watching, holy bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat and handed it out to his companions? Then Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The Son of Man is no lackey to the Sabbath. He's in charge. Then he went back in the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He said to the man with the crippled hand, Stand here where we can see you. Then he spoke to the people, what kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye one after another, angry now, furious at their hard-nosed religion. He said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out. It was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Come on, let's pray. God, we bless you on today. We honor you, O oh God, for this time, this season, for how you continue to remind us of, of your mindfulness, of your love, of your grace, of your mercy. God, thank you. Thank you. We live because you breathe on us. We have our life because you endow us with your spirit. We belong to you. God, thank you for clarity of connection. Thank you, O oh God, for sanctifying our identity. Thank you, O oh God, for saturating us with your love the time we became cognizant of you in our lives, we've never been the same. Thank you. We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor. Take your seat. I'm going to read that again. As the folks say, rest. Take rest. I want to read all of that again. Mark 2, 23 through 3, 6. On Sabbath, one Sabbath day, he was walking through a field of ripe grain. As his disciples made a path, they pulled off he heads of grain. The Pharisees told on them to Jesus, look, your disciples are breaking Sabbath rules. Jesus said, really? 
Haven't you ever read what David did when he was hungry along with those who were with him, how he entered the sanctuary and ate fresh bread off the altar with the chief priest Abiathar right there watching? Holy bread that no one but priests were allowed to eat and handed it out to the companions. Then Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The Son of Man is no lackey to the Sabbath. He's in charge. Then he went back in the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He said to the man with the crippled hand, stand here where we can see you. Then he spoke to the people, what kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye, one after another, angry now, furious at their hard-nosed religion. He said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out. It was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, I follow a rule breaker. Come on, turn to the other neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, I follow a rule breaker. Now put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise on today. Mark 2 is, well, if I'm going to be honest, the gospel of Mark is my favorite gospel. I've said it other times, not just because it's the shortest gospel, <laughs> but because it is the gospel, the first gospel written. And then Matthew and Luke borrow from Mark and expand on the stories of Mark based on the agenda of the authors of Matthew and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels, which simply means they are the same. They seek to tell the same stories. But Mark, Mark's writing is clear, is decisive. It is to the point. He does not draw out the narratives as long as Matthew and Luke. He wants to get to the point of what Jesus came to do. The Gospels are not necessarily biography. They don't give the history all of Jesus. The Gospels in some ways are an expression of those who encountered Jesus and wanted to tell the story of those encounters. And here in Mark 2 in particular, here is where, to me, the Jesus movement picks up steam in this second chapter. The first chapter is about his baptism, his kind of stepping into his identity and then healing people along the way. It's also about him seeking to get away from people who try to co-opt his ministry to make it all about miracles and not about teaching. And then when you get to chapter 2, he begins to really set the framework that angers so much of the religious leaderships who, in Jesus' own words, are fixated on religion but not the move of God. Here in this chapter from the very beginning, you see it. Jesus calls Levi Alphaeus, or who would better be known as Matthew, he calls him. And then he goes and hangs out with the tax collector, Alphaeus, Levi, and all of his friends. He sits there with all the people in that room who the religious leaders have labeled as sinners. He's there among the people who the religious leaders, the religious establishment has deemed unworthy, untouchable. Persons who are viewed as unpure and defiling, they would never themselves be caught dead with some of the people that Jesus was having dinner with right at that moment. They came to critique Jesus. They spoke to his disciples. What, what kind of rabbi, what kind of teacher is your teacher? There are strict rules against hanging out with folk like this, the riffraff, the sinners. And, and yet he consistently hangs out with the folk that we think and deem as ungodly. And yet, Jesus is there feeling quite at home and comfortable with people that the religious folk don't want to be around. 
They questioned him then, and, they, and Jesus makes it clear to them. He said, well, in the Word, you all consider yourselves righteous. I didn't come for you. I didn't come for those who believe themselves to be righteous. I came for those who are hurt and broken and wounded and damaged. Sometimes people who've been hurt and broken and wounded and damaged by the very people who claim to love God. And so this is what he's come to do in that chapter. It opens up. And then, and then he makes it clear, those who question him about fasting. Your disciples don't fast like John's disciples. At least John's disciples fast. But, but y'all don't fast. Now, already, here's another strike. He hangs with sinners. Now he doesn't fast, which was according to the rules again. He said, listen, when, when the bride and bridegroom are together having a party, he said, if the bridegroom is there, if the groom is there, you don't stop the party. You keep the party going. Oh, if you don't believe me, read it yourself. He said, in other words, I'm here. Why should we stop celebrating, stop moving in this movement when God well, when the Word of God has become flesh in your presence, they can't stand Him still. He then breaks it down with another analogy. He said, no one puts um, new patches on old cloth to cover a hole or damage. He said, because then the new patch will begin to spread and break up in that very moment. Then he said, no one puts new wine in old wineskins. He said, you put the new wine in new wineskins. Just to help you understand, the wineskins he's referring to is here, the mind. The new wine he's referring to is this teaching connected to the kingdom that he's bringing to the people. And he understands there's some folks who won't receive it because they represent old wineskins. And so you can't put new wine in old wineskins or else, he said, the wine will burst the old wineskins. And then you get to this scene in chapter 2, where it says here in verse 23, Jesus comes again, right? In this scene, it says Jesus is with his disciples there going through the field. Now, here's what you need to understand. It's Sabbath. Sabbath law is to be honored by all Jews at the time. In fact, it's so serious that the Sabbath is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, Honor the Sabbath. Keep it holy. The Sabbath represented for God's people rest. Why was that important? He did not give the commandments to people who were actually rested. He gave the commandment to people who have been slaves to help them now build a community because if you take people fresh out of captivity and tell them to build community, they will reflect the community they've been in, which is enslavement. And so when they come out of captivity, God lays out some laws for them to build community. And, and one of the things that God instituted for people fresh out of slavery is the idea, the radical revolutionary idea of rest. Rest for those who've been broken. Rest for those who have been damaged. Rest for those who have been wounded. Rest for those who have been enslaved. Rest. The problem is sometimes that when God gives directives, we have a tendency to ritualize them and miss the spirit of the directives. So that now when Jesus and his disciples are going through the field and the disciples now are doing what you're supposed, not supposed to do, which is really work on the Sabbath, separating the, the shaft from, and the wheat, and they were working technically to get food. And, and so the Pharisees, the, as it says here in the Message Bible, the hard-nosed religionists come up to Jesus. What's the deal with your disciples? You all have no regard for the law. You all don't honor the rules we honor. They're in the field picking grain. That is a no-no according to how we understand it. And Jesus makes it clear. He does it so by reminding them. This is beautiful because he's talking to the religious leaders who supposedly know the word or at least the rules, rather, let me be clear. 
And he says, don't you know the story of David when David was on the run from Saul and he entered the high priest's house? And there on the run from Saul with his mighty men of valor, there was only bread there, the bread of the presence, which should only be consumed by the high priest according to God. No one could touch the bread that is on the altar according to God except the high priest. And David went into the temple, went in to the place of the high priest and took the bread and ate the bread and gave it to those who were with him. He broke all those rules. And isn't it amazing that the one who broke the rules established by God, that God then said, he's a man after my own heart. When he said that to them, they could say nothing. Then he had to remind them, don't think that the Sabbath, or rather we were made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for us. Sabbath was given for us. We were not made for it. But the way you're acting about Sabbath, Jesus is helping them understand, you're acting as though we were made for it. This law, this rule, we weren't made for it. It was made for us. This is Jesus speaking. I'm often mesmerized when I have these conversations with people and I actually tell them things that Jesus said. They're blown away. They begin to then wonder, where did you find that? Where in the Scripture is that? Which then leads me to believe that some of the most holiest folk who think they understand things, they read everything in the Bible except what Jesus said. I, I'm sorry to offend those. I mean, clearly, I don't mind offending some people. But, but, but I'm amazed at how people who claim to be so high-minded and holy, so religious, sanctified, and consecrated, who think they the most cleanest Christian in the world, cannot fully understand the teachings of the one whose name they pray in. They don't follow the teachings of the carpenter. They don't follow the way of the carpenter. Here he is, breaking the rules, established by God. I'm not making this up. And then he leaves there and then goes into the synagogue, into the temple. A man is there with a damaged hand on the Sabbath day. Remember what I just said a few minutes ago. Sabbath was made for rest. A man who's been sitting there with a withered hand, a damaged hand, and the Pharisees are waiting. They don't even care about the man who's wounded and damaged. They don't care about what he's going through. They're fixated to see whether or not Jesus is going to break the rules again. Forget about the man who's hurting. Forget about what he's been through. Forget about what he's going through. And Jesus, I love how Eugene Peterson puts in Message Bible. He said, Jesus is furious. Why? You all are so fixated on what you perceive as what God wants that you miss an opportunity to reflect God right in front of you. What good, he said, what do you do on a Sabbath? Do evil or do good? You tell me. What should we do? And they said, nothing. Nothing. Like most folks say when you confront them with Jesus' words. Nothing. He tells the man, I love the other verse of it, stretch out your hand. The man had not stretched out the hand. I've said in times past, that could it be that everybody looked at his hand withered and distorted and assumed that's all it would be? Never challenged him to think differently for itself. Maybe, maybe everyone around him had accepted that this was how he would be, that he would not get any better. And Jesus doesn't see that. He doesn't care what day of the week it is. Because when someone is in need and has been living this kind of life for a long time, you know what they need? Rest. They need Sabbath. Oh, you missed that. Can you imagine folk who are so fixated on Sabbath, they didn't realize when someone needed Sabbath. That he needed rest from the life he had been living. 
And Jesus then dares to see this man differently, dares to see him better, dares to see him whole, and he says, stretch out your hand. I wonder what was going through his mind that Jesus asked him to do something that he had never done before, something that he thought was impossible. I, I would imagine somehow Jesus was helping him to know, my brother, you are the embodiment of infinite possibility. Just because you've never done it doesn't mean you can't do it. Just because you've never seen yourself better don't mean you can't get better. Stretch out your hand. Go ahead and try it out. Try it out and see. And to the man's surprise, when he stretched it out and attempted to stretch it out, watch this. The old restrictions he used to feel, he didn't feel no more. The things in his arm that used to restrain him didn't restrain him anymore. And he stretched out his hand. It's there in the Scriptures on the Sabbath day. I love it. And watch this. Watch what happened. It said that the leaders, the Pharisees, the religious leaders got out of their fast and then went to conspire with folk to figure out how to kill Jesus because Jesus dared to break their rules and at the same time healed a man's life. You see, this is what we miss about the Jesus movement. It is about healing, transformation, new life, new possibility. It's about the kingdom. It is about the things that sometimes we miss even in this day when we're so fixated on what we think are the rules or we think is what God wants. Can you imagine in the face of someone damaged, you've got to figure out what God would want? In the face of someone who's been hurting for a long time, damaged by people even in the religious space, what do you think they need? They need rest. They need rest. They need rest from being ostracized and rest from being marginalized and rest from being talked about and rest from being made to feel like something is wrong with them and rest from folk who look at them funny and rest from people who talk about them and rest from people who think that they're better than them. Rest from people who are so holy that they're no earthly good. Rest from people who are so fixated on what they think is what God wants that they don't do what God needs done in the moment. Rest from from those folk. And we have to ask ourselves a question. I'm going to be done. You're in God's house right now. You're in the sanctuary of God. You read the stories in the New Testament. You see how in every hand, the religious establishment, the leaders were often questioning Jesus, challenging Jesus, telling Jesus what he was doing wrong. And according to the rules, he was breaking the rules. And they always wanted to remind him of how bad he was and how far away from God he was and how disconnected from God he was, that he didn't really know God because he didn't do the things they did and say the things they said and acted the way they acted, that he actually saw human need and human hurt and human pain and and sought to heal and restore it. And you got to ask yourself a question. As you read the Gospels and as you read the stories about Jesus, ask yourself, who am I in this story? Do I stand on the side of the carpenter or am I simply a Christian slash modern day Pharisee? You got to ask yourself, because when you follow the carpenter, folk ain't going to like it. When you dare to stand on what Jesus taught, folk won't like it. But when you're clear about who you belong to and who God has made you to be, you honor the teachings of the carpenter. Y'all worried about Sabbath? but not worried about rest. That is the way of the carpenter. Beloved, there will always be people in your midst whose lives reflect a deep and abiding 
woundedness. The deep and abiding brokenness. People who come into your presence and you can feel their pain. You can feel their hurt. You can feel the gloom that hovers over them. And when they come into their pre your presence, how will they leave? When I read the Gospels and I see these people come into Jesus' presence, you know what I don't see? And check it out for yourself. Don't just listen to me. I don't see the wounded in Jesus' presence being hit with scriptures. I don't see Jesus quoting Torah in the face of a withered man with a withered hand or woman bent over double or the widower named son or the Samaritan woman. I don't see Jesus doing that. He speaks words of healing. And what? Love. And restoration. How can you fight Jesus on that? The idea that Jesus wants to see people better. We miss that in this day. We miss the idea that we are called to bring healing to the broken places. That we are called to bring love to the hate-filled places. This is what we're called to do in Jesus' name. That's why I love, and I keep repeating it, they're my favorite scriptures, Luke 4, Matthew 25. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For it has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. To proclaim freedom for those who are oppressed. To bring sight to the blind. To set the captives free. To say that this is the year of God's faith. That's what Jesus said he was anointed to do. And if you dare say you follow him, the marching orders are clear. Good news to the poor. Proclaim release to the captive, those who are oppressed. Sight to the blind. Liberty to those who are held captive. That this is the year of God's radical restoration, jubilee. Jubilee. Do you know what jubilee was? That every seven years was jubilee. The deep thing is that when Jesus says this in that year, it's not a jubilee year. But what he's saying really is that every year is a year. Jubilee was a time when those who were enslaved were set free. Those who were in debt, the debt was wiped out every seven years. That's the gospel of Jesus. And then in case you wonder, well, I want to go to heaven. I want to I wanna make sure that one day I sit on the right hand of God, that I want to go to glory and be with God. Jesus said, okay, you want to do that? Make sure that with somebody around you hungry, you feed them. Because I know folk who can quote every scripture from Genesis to Revelations. They ain't fed nobody yet. Somebody thirsty, give them something to drink. Somebody needs a coat in the wintertime, give them a coat. Somebody sick, let them know that they're not alone, go visit them. Even those who are in jail, go check on them. And then when you go someplace and there's a stranger around you that nobody knows, make them feel welcomed. 
If you do this, Jesus says, you know what? You're then called righteous. We cannot let Jesus' mission be hijacked by folk who scared to be disciples. This is who we're called to be, beloved. Come on, stand on your feet today. I want us to pray. I want us to pray today. And as we pray, as we pray, I want you to imagine that you're that man in the temple that day, the synagogue in the meeting place. Imagine you're that man, just for a moment. People been looking at you funny because the belief was if you had an affliction, you must be a sinner. Here you are just wanting fellowship, but no one wants to be near you. You can hear people whispering about you, talking about you, because they perceive you as different. They don't embrace you. In fact, they push you away because they don't want to catch what you have. Just imagine being that man that day. And the truth is, he may have been coming to the meeting place, the synagogue, for a long time. And the tragedy is that broken people can come to the meeting place and never leave whole. Imagine you're him and you come. Now you've been coming out of obedience and ritual. You didn't understand that, that on one day, the insecurity and ignorance of a group of people would lead to your breakthrough. He didn't know that this would be the day where the ignorance and the insecurity of the religious leaders would be confronted by the carpenter from Galilee. And here they were, all gathered in the synagogue, looking at you, your him. And they're not looking at you because they want to help you. They're not looking at you because they want to restore you. They're looking at you because they're waiting to see what he will do so they can catch him. They don't even see your brokenness. They've been seeing it all this time. They've done nothing about it. And as you're sitting there, silent, hoping, you hear Jesus say, is it better to do evil or good on the Sabbath? You see, Jesus' rage at the religious leaders whose religiosity apparently trumps love. And then he turns to you, Jesus, and tells you to do what you never thought you could do. And to your surprise, you do it. While we pray, I want you to do something. Stretch out your hand today. That outstretched hand represents the deficiencies you thought you had. That outstretched hand represents all the time you felt like you were awkward, different. That outstretched hand represents the times when people didn't understand you but talked about you anyhow. That outstretched hand represents the times you didn't feel like you fit in anywhere, that you felt alone and afraid. That outstretched hand represents your past hurts, your hang-ups, your habits. That outstretched hand represents your damage, your woundedness, your affliction. That outstretched hand. And the truth is, some of us have been living with withered hands. But no more. Because you've been seen, not by the folk who want to hurl scripture at you. You've been seen by the one who shows you love. Love. God, thank you for seeing us. Thank you, God for being mindful.
mindful of us. Thank you, God, for restoring us and making us strong in the broken places. Thank you, God, for the moments, oh God, where we were bludgeoned by our imperfections and destroyed by our mistakes, but you saw us and you still see us. And now you're telling us, straighten out that hand. Because the thing that used to be the thing that defined you negatively will be the thing that defines you lovingly. And I will heal you in front of your enemies. I will restore you in front of those who pray against you. I will lift you in front of those who've sought to destroy your possibility. I'll prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Stretch out your hand. And don't be ashamed of who you are. Stretch out your hand and embrace the love of God. God, we thank you. We honor you. And we're so grateful that you're still in the healing business. We're so grateful that you're still in the loving business. We're so grateful that you're still in the forgiving business. For when I feel forsaken, the Lord will take me up. God walks with us and talks with us and tells us we belong to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Can't nobody do us like you, oh God. Thank you. We say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. You can take a seat for a second. We're getting ready to leave. It's 12.01. Some of y'all got reservations at 12.30. We're bringing back our tradition. Every other month at FCBC, we do on first Sunday, communal communion. What better way to demonstrate the possibility of God than this way? And if you're here for the first time and you've never done communal communion, before you start, folks, are, oh, this is not, no. Communion is about building community. Building community. And so today, when you leave here, you're gonna build community. As you leave today, on deacons and our ministers and our all-in team. They're going to be outside upstairs. They'll catch you as you're leaving. Make sure as you leave today, you grab two of these cups. Grab one for yourself. And with the other one, you know what you do? Build communion. Share it with somebody. Have your own personal communion moment right there. All right? Because that's what it means. Because you don't know who has been waiting to be seen. Why not be seen by you? And then together be seen by God. Amen. So two things before you leave. One, if you're here today, you've never been baptized. You, you never entered this Jesus movement, this discipleship journey. You've never been baptized. After service, you can come down here to my left here, right? Some of the folk will still be here for you. All right, good, they're there. And then don't forget those of you who have been dealing with grief and want some help with that, and you want to join the grief group led by the Hope Center, Dr. Green, you can come down after service to my right, your left on this side with Dr. Green and let her know, and she'll get you started. Amen? Come on, let's stand today.
I got a, a message yesterday from an unlikely person. I thought it was beautiful. It was from, some may know, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson. Now, in case you don't know who this is, he was a bishop, a preacher, who was kicked out of his denomination for believing that God forgives everybody. Think about that. And he said, everybody is going to be in glory. And they kicked him out. Because for some folk, they got to be able to put some people in hell. sent me a very long message yesterday and but one of the things he said he said pastor a great awakening is happening he said and I know for a fact that God has chosen you to be part of this he said I can hear it in your voice now I don't say that to be but I say there's something profound is happening this is a right time for the Jesus movement it's the best time for Jesus people. I'm not talking about those who just join church. And, no, but those who take the teaching seriously. And you actually seek to order your life according to these teachings. These teachings that are grounded in love. You can't tell me God is love and let hate fly out your mouth. Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by what? The love you have for one another. I want to be known as a disciple. I'm going to let love be my guide. And love be how I take the lead. Amen? All right. So when you leave today, don't forget, they'll be outside and you can get those trays. And we'll depart. We thank God that it's warming up outside. Only in New York will you see the weather report, and on the screen, it says it's mad brick this weekend. That's only in New York. Listen, beloved, come on, let's go. Let's leave in prayer. Now when you, O oh God, is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless in your presence, may you continue to remind us that we follow the teachings of a rule breaker. From now until we meet again on the other side, where the sun neither rises nor sets, because the sun of possibility is Jesus the Christ, the light of the world. It is in your name, O oh God, we pray. And we say amen. 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 Much love, peace, many blessings, beloved. Have an amazing day.